Volume 3, Chapter 2 The Ohio Lands, Pontiac's Rebellion The first and immediate problem the British faced was what to do with the Ohio lands, which had been militarily conquered from the French by 1759. Since the European war with France was not to be ended for four more years, the Ohio lands would continue, at least temporarily, from 1759 on under British military occupation. First to swing into action with a claim to Ohio lands was the Ohio Company. In 1749, the Ohio Company, a Virginia company headed by the president of the royally appointed Virginia Council, Thomas Lee, and including the Lee family, the Washington family, and George Mason, induced the Crown to direct Virginia to grant the company 200,000 acres of French-held land at the strategic forks of the Ohio River. Soon, Robert Dinwiddie, royal governor of Virginia from 1751 to 1758, his patron, the powerful imperialist, the Duke of Bedford, and the powerful Mercer and Carter families were added to the Ohio Company. Now, with Britain in full military control of the Ohio lands, the Ohio Company naturally swung into action, putting pressure on the Crown and the military for acknowledgment of its claim. During 1760, officials of the company offered Colonel Henry Bouquet, Commandant of Fort Pitt, a share in the company. The Ohio Company, however, met formidable resistance among British officialdom. The new governor of Virginia, Francis Fouquier, was trenchantly opposed to the Ohio Company and to land grants in general. Furthermore, the British militia dug in for a lengthy stay and constructed many more forts in the Ohio Valley. Finally, the Earl of Egremont, in November 1761, officially proclaimed a British policy of prohibiting all grants to settlements upon Indian lands, thus blocking the Ohio Company or any other settlement. As soon as the fighting ended in 1760, General Geoffrey Amherst, the British commander, indulged his absolute contempt and hatred for the Indians. The substantial supply of presents that the British had been wont to grant the Indians was suddenly cut off now that France was beaten. Moreover, Amherst arbitrarily decreed severe restrictions on the amount of ammunition that could be traded or given to the Indians. With the supply of ammunition, so necessary to their livelihood of hunting, suddenly cut off, the Indians were naturally embittered against the English. When the Indians protested, Amherst savagely told them, through intermediaries, that should they cause any trouble, they must not only expect the severest retaliation, but an entire destruction of all their nations, for I am firmly resolved, whenever they give me an occasion, to extirpate them root and branch. As a typical hardliner, Amherst scoffed at the suggestion that the Indians might be either capable of causing or courageous enough to create any real mischief. He was therefore heedless of repeated warnings of probable Indian uprising upon the cutting off of their ammunition. In addition to cutting off the Indians' supply of ammunition, Amherst ruthlessly blocked their supply of rum. Not only did he prohibit any sale of rum to the natives, but he also ordered all trading to be confined to the British forts in order to enforce the ban. Also aggravating Indian resentment was the personal arrogance of the British toward them, a striking contrast to the previous friendliness and camaraderie of the French. The Indians were expected to conduct business at the forts and then leave. The English soldiers were forbidden to fraternize with them. Another Indian grievance was Amherst's arrogant disregard of English treaties with the Western Indians and of the Crown's own pronouncements. 
by permitting white settlement and by giving Seneca Indian lands at Niagara Falls to some of Amherst officers. The gifts were, of course, made without bothering to purchase the land from the tribes. Alarmed by the threat to their lands, the Indians were further disturbed by the rapid British construction of new forts, especially the one at Sandusky Bay on the southwest shore of Lake Erie. Amherst grew particularly cocky from the ruthless British suppression during 1761 of a Cherokee uprising in South Carolina. The Western Indians were driven to a point of desperation by the news in early 1763 that their friends, the French, had ceded the whole of America east of the Mississippi to the hated British. Jeffrey Amherst simply shrugged off the problem of disturbed Indians. Whatever idle notions they may entertain in regard to the sessions can be of very little consequence. But General Amherst was soon to find out that the consequences were great indeed, for on May 7 the Indians launched a general uprising dedicated to driving the hated British out of all lands west of the Appalachians. Headed by the great Ottawa chief Pontiac, the Pontiac Rebellion began with the massacre of a band of British soldiers near Detroit, followed by the rapid conquest of all the forts in the northern Ohio Valley, including Fort Sandusky and Fort Miami's, now Fort Wayne, Indiana, with the exception of the great fort of Detroit. This conquest was completed by the beginning of June 1763 and included the destruction of a troop sent to relieve Detroit from Indian siege. Hearing the great news of victory, the Indians further east joined the rebellion. In the Allegheny region, Forts Le Boeuf, Presque Isle, and Venango were quickly captured by Senecas and Hurons, and Delawares and Shawnees had even besieged Fort Pitt by the end of June. General Hamhurst perfectly exemplified the classical hardliner, the eternally tough enemy of appeasement. Like all hardliners, he was ignorant of the fears, aims, or motivations of those he designated as the enemy. He knew only that they were evil and contemptible, men easily cowed by the equivalent of a whiff of grape. Convinced that they would not dare to resist stern and harsh measures, Amherst found, as hardliners invariably do, that repression only provoked resistance, and suddenly the despised enemy was striking and winning on many fronts. One would think that the hardliner, seeing the abject failure of his policy, seeing his toughness only provoke a conflict, would have the grace to admit his error and retire from the scene. But the hardliner has never done so. Instead, he takes the outbreak as merely an indication that only extermination can be the deserts of such a diabolical enemy. To Amherst, negotiations for peace became more traitorous than ever. General Amherst reacted to the Indian uprising as might be expected. At first, and for quite a while, he refused to believe that near savages could have the gall to attack, much less in danger post where British soldiers were stationed. When he finally realized the scope of the war, he could only express amazement. He could not believe that his own actions might have provoked the war. The enemy must be irrational. It is difficult, my lord, he wrote to the British Secretary of State, to account any causes that can have induced these barbarians to this perfidious attempt. Driven into frenzy, Amherst vowed, as is typical of the hardliner, ruthless extermination of the enemy. He set upon all-out punishment and frantically ordered his commanders to take no prisoners. As he ordered one troop, the Indians were to be treated 
not as a generous enemy, but as the vilest race of beings that ever infested the earth, and whose riddance from it must be esteemed a meritorious act for the good of mankind. You will therefore take no prisoners, but put to death all that fall into your hands. If the Indians were truly subhuman, then any means for their extermination was proper. Accordingly, Amherst, in early July, directed his chief aide, Colonel Henry Bouquet, a Swiss mercenary, to spread smallpox among the Indians. Colonel Bouquet, an apt pupil, answered that he would send blankets infected with smallpox as gifts to the Indians. Delighted, Amherst replied that you will do well to try to inoculate the Indians by means of blankets, as well as to try every other method that can serve to extirpate this execrable race. One other method was hunting the Indian vermin down with dogs, but this proved impracticable because of the scarcity of good English hunting dogs in the colonies. Thus Pontiac's rebellion gave rise to one of the great advances of the art of modern war, germ warfare. As in the case of other important inventions in history, other great minds were thinking along the same lines, even as General Amherst was adumbrating the concept of germ warfare, his commandant at Fort Pitt had been putting it into practice. Captain Simeon Ecuer, another Swiss mercenary, generously gave two smallpox-infected blankets to the Delaware Indians. The new theory bore fruit, and soon smallpox raged among the Delawares and the Shawnees, and seriously reduced the fighting spirit of the eastern Ohio tribes. Germ warfare was not decisive, however. The summer of 1763 found all the Ohio country in the hands of the Indians, except for the besieged forts of Pitt and Detroit. The Indians proceeded to ravage the frontier settlements of Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia. By the end of the year, over a thousand whites had been killed or captured. Unfortunately for the Indians, neither the more northerly nor the southern Indians revolted. In New York, the Iroquois, except for the Senecas, remained pro-British. To the south, the Cherokees were still cowed by the suppression two years earlier, and by the lavish presents given them at a great conference in Augusta arranged by Lord Egremont. The turning points of the war were Colonel Bouquet's ability to relieve Fort Pitt after his victory at Bushy Run in early August and Fort Detroit's ability to withstand Pontiac's siege. Pontiac had always clung to the hope that the beloved French, still occupying Louisiana and the Illinois country, would come to his aid and drive out the English once again. But in October, the French commander in Illinois wrote to Pontiac and told him the facts of life. The French had made peace and were indeed leaving, and the Indians had better make peace themselves. His heart no longer in the war, Pontiac offered peace, and the offer was accepted by the Commandant of Detroit. The Indians were ready to quit and make peace. The big question now was the attitude of the British Army. Would it make peace calmly and bloodlessly? Or would it insist on bloody vengeance to be wreaked upon guilty and innocent Indians alike in the name of punishment. Amherst, no longer a hero, had been happy to hurry back to England in October, leaving General Thomas Gage with the task of crushing the Indians' insurrection and punishing those tribes who have so ungratefully attacked their benefactors. Gage's instincts were certainly a hard line, but he soon realized that a policy of suppressing the western Indians would at least drive them west of the Mississippi into Louisiana and thus end the lucrative British beaver trade with them. The Indians to the east, however, 
had no such escape route, so Gage sent out two punitive expeditions in the summer and fall of 1764. But Colonel John Bradstreet, leaving Fort Niagara in the summer with a formidable force, had either the wisdom or the naivete to circumvent Gage's rather vague orders and to conclude a just and easy peace with the Shawnees and the Delawares, insisting only on the Indians' surrender of all their English prisoners. Gage and Bouquet were furious at this failure to wreak vengeance to punish these infamous murders by the Indians. Gage refused to ratify the peace and ordered an attack on the Indians, who at the same time had failed to surrender the white prisoners. Colonel Bouquet was now sent out in the fall of 1764 from Fort Pitt with orders to pillage and kill all the Shawnees and Delawares in Ohio that they could find and to burn all their villages. He was then to force the Indians not only to surrender prisoners but also to deliver up the murderers of white traders, to pay a high indemnity to the traders, and to renounce all land east of the Ohio River. Bouquet, however, found out that the Indians had been preparing to surrender their prisoners to Bradstreet, and, out in the field, even the tough Bouquet agreed to forego punishment for the prompt surrender of captives. By mid-November, with Gage giving him carte blanche, Bouquet had concluded peace with the Delawares and Shawnees in return for the prompt return of white prisoners. Unfortunately, the British insisted on forced repatriation, including as prisoners all whites who had grown to prefer Indian life and half-breed children born in the Indian camps. At any rate, rationality triumphed over repression, and a formal and harmonious peace was concluded with Delawares and Shawnees in the spring of 1765. The only imposed indemnity was to be land-granted as compensation to the English traders.' 